Sorry for the delay in getting this one uploaded, but an unexpected illness kept me from doing much of anything for almost a week. I won't say what it was here, but will admit that while it was debilitating enough to keep me home the entire time, it was also painful enough to keep me from being able to concentrate on writing. Oh, and spoilers for all the Scooby stuff coming. Hi, this is Joe the Editor. After my health issue subsided enough for me to be able to write and film again, the city started doing work in front of my house, which made it too noisy to record for several days. Once they were finished with that, then my computer they had an issue that delayed me for several more days as I waited for a part to arrive. Mm -hmm. Today, Scooby-Doo meets the Three Stooges. Another shortcut gone wrong leads the gang to a rural airfield haunted by the ghost of a famous World War I flying ace and three bumbling acquaintances. The bumbling acquaintances weren't haunting the airfield. They just happened to arrive at the same time as the gang. They weren't even dead. Not for three more years at any rate. And 21 years. Mr. Siegfried, the manager of a small airport, learned the county was planning to expand the airfield where he worked and would be purchasing it as well as the surrounding farmland. He decided to swindle his boss, Mr. Sawyer, and the local farmers by convincing them to sell their land to Siegfried cheaply so he could then resell it to the government for a large profit. Red Baron's trying to force him down! <laughs> Siegfried decided his best course of action was to dress up as the ghost of the Red Baron to scare away all the existing pilots and ruin the airport financially, while at the same time destroying the farmer's crops with weed killer. Wait a minute. Dressing up as a ghost with a flying machine in order to scare farmers away so he could buy their land for less than market value and resell it to the government for a large profit. Why does this sound familiar? <laughs> yes, this is essentially the exact same scheme as the space kook. The nice thing about a recycled plot is I don't have to spend much time rehashing stuff I already went over in a previous video. You did already watch that video, right? Just in case, a quick recap. It's impossible to determine exactly how profitable the scheme would be if successful because land value for the time and location is difficult to ascertain. However, as shown in my space kook analysis, it was likely that the money involved would be a tidy sum, just not enough to retire comfortably on a tropical island somewhere. And that's only if Siegfried had enough cash on hand not to have to finance the land sales with bank loans. It was also explained that regardless of how much a swindler thinks they can get by reselling their fraudulently obtained real estate, the government has a policy of eminent domain, which would prevent Siegfried from receiving more than fair market value for the properties. In fact, public records might even show just how much he actually paid, and it's probable the government would offer little more than that. It's also unlikely that the county's plans to build a new airport would have gone unnoticed by the farmers, and particularly Mr. Sawyer, the owner of the current airfield. They would have had no reason to panic and sell to Siegfried when all they had to do was wait until the government came to make an offer. It's also questionable why he destroyed the crops, considering the USDA helps insure farmers for damage to their fields. In fact, damaging their crops was a very dumb thing to do. I'm no expert on how the USDA operates, but they have been helping farmers with insurance since the 1930s, so it wouldn't surprise me that if a dozen farmers in a particular area all submitted claims for ruined crops at the same time, there would be more than a few investigations launched into the reason. As I've said before, the federal government and insurance industry have just a bit more resources at their disposal than four teenagers and a talking dog. Finally, 
Just how was Siegfried going to explain to his former boss at the closing table why he was the one buying the land when it was supposedly worthless due to the haunting? There's no way that wouldn't set off a few warning bells. While the space cook received the highest score for the design of his plan, I can't do the same for Siegfried here for two reasons, with the first being the obvious one. This plan wasn't original. Space Kook did it first. Second, Space Kook had to deal with a belligerent farmer who wasn't likely to sell his land to the government, making his scheme almost patriotic by helping the authorities avoid a potential standoff by an irate man armed with a shotgun. In the situation here, however, the airfield's owner, Mr. Sawyer, looks like a reasonable man who wouldn't be likely to shoot at federal agents knocking on the door to his office. Thus, it's only fair to give Siegfried a 3.5 out of 5 for the design of his plan. Just because something isn't original doesn't mean it can't still be a good idea. He just should have found another way to drive off the farmers. While it makes sense that an airport ghost should have something to do with flying, it's still a bit baffling why Siegfried would choose the Red Baron as the specter in question. We don't know exactly where Mr. Sawyer's airfield is, but it's more than likely either in the northern half of California or somewhere in the Midwest. Neither of these locations are Poland, France, or Germany, the three places where Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron, was born, died, and buried. In other words, why would a ghost haunt a location that had no connection to it when it was alive? If the Scooby writers were determined to include the Red Baron in the story, they could have easily avoided this confusing element by including a single line of dialogue about Mr. Sawyer being the grandson or other descendant of the pilot who shot down the Red Baron. After all, this is why C.L. Magnus claimed his shipping line had been haunted by the ghost of Redbeard due to a relative having brought the pirate to justice. More on Redbeard later in this video. The fact that the villain's name was Siegfried might explain why he chose the Red Baron, a hero of his probable ancestral homeland. This leaves him as the only one of the three suspects in the episode with any hint of a connection to the ghost. The other suspects were airport owner Mr. Sawyer, whose last name is of English origin, and mechanic Andrew Terra, whose last name is more popular in South America. Look out below! I'm headed for Terra Firma! In Mr. Terra's case, it's probable his name was chosen by the writers because the expression terra firma means solid ground, appropriate for an airplane mechanic who isn't generally the one who will be flying in the sky. Choice of the disguise aside, was it effective? Well, it was certainly a disturbing look with the gaunt, pasty white face, and while he didn't glow, the ghost of the Red Baron flew even when not inside his plane, so... Kudos to Siegfried for knowing how a phantom is supposed to operate. The hopping, though, is unusual, but while such a method of conveyance isn't common, there does exist a vampire zombie monster from China called the Jiangxi, famous for the creepy way it hops toward its victims. Though it's possible that Siegfried would have known about that particular monster, it's more likely he just had access to springs and figured they would give him added mobility as well as a more supernatural way of moving instead of running or walking. It's not like the Jiangxi had anything to do with the Red Baron at any rate. If anything, the zombies from the season 2 episode of Where Are You set in Chinatown should have been the ones to hop. You were right, Velma. It is the Red Baron's plane. Get back! He's coming this way! Siegfried's disguise was also scary enough to make Fred, Velma, and Daphne hide and run from him when they stumbled onto his hideout, though it's fair to say his outfit had little to do with scaring the pilots away from the airfield as they were reacting more to him trying to knock them out of the sky than fear of the supernatural. Incidentally, in real life, the Red Baron was killed while flying a Fokker DR-1 triplane with three wings. In this episode, he's flying a biplane with two wings. While Rick Toven did fly a biplane for the majority of his military career, wouldn't it have made more sense for the spirit of a pilot to be flying the kind of airplane in which he died? The Ghost of the Red Baron is still original, despite being another flying-based specter like the Space Kook, 
and this was the first time the gang encountered the ghost of an actual, real-life historical figure. Even weirder if you consider that had the Red Baron lived, he'd have been 80 when this episode aired, meaning he likely had living relatives who may have possibly watched this episode. Considering how Snoopy was already famous for his rivalry with the Red Baron, and now Scooby-Doo, his family must have wondered just what the hell American cartoon dogs had against their famous military ancestor. What's next? Goofy from Mickey Mouse going to pee on Manfred's grave? Regardless, I'm giving the Ghost of the Red Baron a 4.5 out of 5 for his outfit. It was original, scary, and had some special effects. The only thing wrong was it didn't make any sense for the location. The episode begins with the Ghost of the Red Baron trying to commit murder by forcing another plane down. I cannot overstress the seriousness of this act. Flying a plane takes a lot of training because the repercussions of pilot error can result in serious injury and death, and not just for the people in the plane. Pilots and passengers can die from hard landings, let alone smashing into cornfields and trees. He's heading straight for us! The episode also begins with the Ghost of the Red Baron making the prime mistake of all Scooby villains that doesn't involve kidnapping Daphne. He got the attention of Fred and the rest. In this situation, it was by running them off the road. Why would he do that? The gang weren't involved at that point. They were merely driving through the country, minding their own business. For a change. You can't even argue that the ghost of the Red Baron was trying to get rid of witnesses, because the more people around to see him, the more likely the story would spread that the skies were haunted and no one would want to fly for the airport. Siegfried earns high points for attempted murder, but loses some for being overzealous and getting the gang involved in his scheme when they were just passing through. Then again, I could be treating him too harshly because they had already seen him trying to crash the crop dusting plane and they would likely stop to check on the victim regardless. Fortunately, the pilot wasn't injured, so the gang didn't have the opportunity to inadvertently leave him in the hands of his assailant instead of calling an ambulance. As seen by the slew of wrecked airplanes scattered throughout the airfield, this is another case of the villain having mostly succeeded in his plan until the gang started meddling. By this point, all the pilots had quit, and most of the surrounding farmland was turned into my front yard. Captain Carly at your service, sir. My credentials. You advertise for a first-rate pilot. Acme Flying Service. Good for one free lesson. <laughs> Siegfried could have stopped wearing his costume and just waited for the airport to close, but unfortunately, he decided to keep going. It's possible he never saw a Three Stooges film, and thus had no idea that Mr. Sawyer hiring Curly Joe as a pilot was possibly the best thing for his scheme to ruin the airport. Not only was Curly Joe likely to crash whatever plane he was in, there was no way he wouldn't find some way to screw up the crop dusting, even if he managed to keep a steady flight. And that's without the need for alcohol and insane drug-fueled conspiracy theories. Despite being mostly successful, Siegfried still suffered from a lack of adaptability often shown by Scooby villains. His plot involved taking down airplanes and poisoning crops, so he didn't have any good ideas for getting rid of nosy teenagers other than locking them up in his hideout. For what it's worth, if he wanted to maintain authenticity, the real-life Red Baron did carry a Luger sidearm with an eight-round capacity, and there were eight witnesses between the Scooby Gang and the Stooges. Just saying. It's not like he wasn't capable of murder. Apart from however many pilots almost died when he crashed their planes, what did he think was going to happen to Velma, a non-pilot, when he launched her into the sky? Speaking of Velma's plane, it's nice to see one that isn't purple for a change. Purple is my favorite color, but by having every plane other than the one flown by the Red Baron being the same color makes it that much easier for continuity errors to rear up. Let's look at some. Yeah. 
The first purple plane we see is the single seater forced down by the Ghost of the Red Baron that ends up covered in corn and smashed into by the Mystery Machine. No wonder Fred slammed into the airplane. That's not the brake pedal. Who taught him to drive? My son? Shortly afterward, that same plane is immediately taken into the air by Curly Joe and Scooby, only to subsequently crash again, this time losing both its tires and rear landing skid. He deliberately went through the corn to slow his descent. A genius! I once argued with my father, an amateur pilot himself, about his flying record. He denied ever crashing despite my reminding him about the time he ended up in a cornfield. His argument as to why that didn't count as a crash wasn't too far off what Sawyer said about Curly Joe's landing. Are all airplane people this deluded? A genius! He can outfly the Red Bear on himself. He brings that ship down in one piece and I'll pay him double. Remember, you said you'd pay double. Sawyer said he'd pay the Stooges double if the plane landed in one piece. How is losing both tires and rear landing skid in one piece? Incidentally, whenever any aircraft is involved in a mishap, regardless of how minor, it is generally not cleared for flight again until a maintenance crew gives it a thorough examination. But here we see Mr. Sawyer not only allowing a guy he just met with no credentials to fly a plane that was recently involved in an accident, but also take a dog into the pilot seat as well. Siegfried may not be the only villain in this episode, is what I'm implying. We then see this same plane being towed to the airfield by Mr. Sawyer, with both wheels reattached and no visible damage from the mystery machine. Remember, the mystery machine smashed into it hard enough to pop a tire on the van, so there being no signs of damage on the plane from that level of impact is inconceivable. Inconceivable! By the way, there's also no damage to the body of the mystery machine. So why didn't the gang just change the tire right there? There was no need to get it towed. Not to mention that it's not a good idea to let a vehicle with a flat tire be pulled over a long distance like that, as it would likely end up damaging the rim. Mr. Siegfried ordered me to repair the wheels. Mr. Siegfried? He manages the airport for Mr. Sawyer. Uh, well, we were just leaving. Fred just put the spare on the mystery machine, and now it's gone. In fact, it's missing throughout much of the rest of the episode until later on when we see Shaggy fixing it again. Tomorrow, the Red Baron is going to meet his match if he tries to fool with Mr. Sawyer's new pilot. New pilot? Uh, you will excuse me. I must get parts to fix this wheel uh, so Captain Curly can get off the ground. The next time we see the purple single-seater plane, the tire is being repaired by Mr. Terra, the mechanic. He does not finish the repair before leaving for more parts, and we can see the wheel is not attached. Absolutely nothing! Shortly afterward, the Ghost of the Red Baron starts the purple single-seater plane's engine, and it chases the gang, with both wheels attached, before smashing into a wall of fertilizer bags. We even hear the sound of a lot of damage. That crazy plane started up all by itself and chased us around the hangar! Now that is scientifically impossible. How does it feel not to be believed by someone, Fred? Pretty lousy, right? Maybe next time Shaggy or Scooby say they see a ghost, you won't be so quick to dismiss them. One of you must have touched something in the cockpit. Wanna bet? Well, it's not important. Yes, an unsupervised group of teenagers and a dog without a leash are in my hangar, and one of the airplanes just smashed into a wall. That's not important. I'm starting to understand why there are all those crashed and improperly stored airplanes all over the place. Strange things have been happening around here for the past few weeks. Perhaps it would be better for your own safety if you left tonight. There isn't a ghost alive we can't expose. Whatever you wish. But remember, I warned you for your own good. Again, unsupervised teenagers. He's the airport manager. And the villain. Just tell the kids to get out of there and call the police if they refuse. It's not rocket science. 
Curly Joe is going to fly that crate in the morning, and we're going to stay right here and make sure nobody tampers with it. Velma says Curly Joe is going to fly that crate in the morning, implying there is just the one airplane for the gang to guard. We then later see Fred sleeping on the purple single-seater plane, presumably so he would be awakened if anyone tried to tamper with it. The purple single-seater plane is shown once again to be undamaged, though I suppose it's possible it was repaired by Mr. Terra in the meantime, though highly unlikely due to the amount of damage it sustained. But hey, cartoon physics, I suppose. To further add to the continuity confusion, Velma was originally hiding in the purple single-seater plane, but then it switched to a green vehicle when in the air. Come on, Ace, let's get this crane off the ground. That was a rudder pedal, stupid. The fat diamond did it again. Come on, fellas, wake up! Well, we gotta see if Velma's okay! Why were the Stooges asleep? It makes sense that they were knocked unconscious by the earlier impact with the wall, except we saw them completely unfazed immediately after the crash. The Stooges try coming to her rescue in a purple two-seater plane, which is then subsequently crashed and completely ruined, only for the next time it appears on screen to be completely repaired without even a scratch on it. The next time we see a purple plane, it's the single seater getting its hopper filled with weed killer by the ghost of the Red Baron, who, after trapping the gang and the Three Stooges at his hideout, flies it himself to presumably drop the weed killer on the remaining undamaged crops. He's then subsequently chased by Shaggy and Scooby using a tiny radio-controlled Red Baron plane. This chase ends with him landing the purple single-seater plane, only for him to immediately take off again in his own red airplane. However, the last time we saw that airplane, the gang and the Stooges had used it to escape the ghost of the Red Baron's hideout by tying a handsaw to the plane's prop and using it to cut through the hideout's door. Though for some reason, the saw was no longer on the prop after they broke out. Regardless, the Ghost of the Red Baron used his remote control to call his plane to him, but instead of being outside the damaged remains of his hideout, his plane was somehow in the hangar at the airfield. Also, Shaggy and Scooby are shown here with everyone else, despite them being in the airport tower flying the tiny Red Baron plane. So then Fred, Daphne, and Velma join all three of the Stooges in the two-seater purple plane to chase the Ghost of the Red Baron, despite all six of them not really needing to be on the flight. In fact, would it have even been able to lift off with three times the number of people it was built for? The weight capacity of an airplane is not something many of us think about, but it absolutely is a critical consideration when it comes to flying. Did you say this crate is loaded with weed killer, Captain? A crop duster can carry a literal ton of fertilizer, and we know they're flying with a full hopper, so that plane is carrying close to 600 pounds more human weight than it was designed for. I may be giving this way too much thought, pun not intended, but then again the entire point of my videos is spending way too much thought on stuff like this. Wait, how in the hell did Fred and the girls end up in the pilot seat? Perhaps it's unfair to consider all these moments as continuity errors, since it's at least possible the airfield had multiple purple crop dusting planes. But all this confusion could have been avoided had the producers just given all the aircraft different colors. But, who knows, maybe Hanna-Barbera got a discount on purple paint that month. A surplus they were obviously still working through over three years later. For his operation score, I'm giving Siegfried a 4 out of 5. 
By the time the gang got involved, he had already almost completely driven the airfield out of business and only one local farmer still had healthy crops. While the design of the scheme itself was questionable, his follow-through was mostly competent. The mystery machine being in the area was simply beyond his control. This leaves the Ghost of the Red Baron with a very respectable due score, a 4 out of 5. You've got tons of fertilizer in the hangar, and this droopy plant looks like it's starving to death. I keep putting fertilizer on it every day, and it gets worse instead of better. That's your problem. Even if you weren't inadvertently using weed killer, you're still over-fertilizing. Houseplants should only get fertilized weekly at most. You could kill them if you do it daily. Yikes! <laughs> Those are barrels of used motor oil. Not water. That's not only toxic as hell, but also not easily cleaned off. Especially out of dog fur. It's been a while, but here we see more superhuman strength from a Scooby villain. The Ghost of the Red Baron ripped apart that metal ladder like it was paper. Hey, save some for me! You're nothing but a hound dog. <laughs> I can't help but wonder if either Casey Kasem messed up, or this was just another baffling line in a Scooby script. Sure, Hound Dog was a well-known song from two decades earlier, and Hanna-Barbera loved slipping in occasional pop culture references, especially when those references were five years or more out of date, but wouldn't it have made more sense for Shaggy to call Scooby a chow hound? The situation they were in called for wordplay based on eating, not singing. <laughs> Very interesting. Very interesting was a catchphrase made famous by Artie Johnson on Laugh-In, a sketch comedy show that was in its final season when this Scooby episode aired, thus making this one of the very rare times Hanna-Barbera slipped in a contemporary pop culture reference. <laughs> It's one thing to lose an engine, but without wings, there's no gliding to a rough landing. That's an immediate dropping like a stone to your death. Cartoon physics. Who's this? Good grief, it's Siegfried! Jinkies! I was positive it was old Mr. Terra! There goes Daphne with her Velma impersonation again. Now's not the time, Daph. Today, Scooby-Doo meets the Globetrotters! The gang once again forget how headlights work in the fog, leaving both them and the Harlem Globetrotters stranded in a swamp. They seek help from nearby deserted inn, where they meet what should be a familiar trio of ghosts, but inexplicably isn't. The Harlem Globetrotters are a famous exhibition basketball team known for their trick shots and comedic antics. Though founded in the 1920s and still playing around the world today, their biggest impact on pop culture was arguably in the 1970s, when in addition to a live-action variety show, they also had two separate animated series produced by Hanna-Barbera. The first Hanna-Barbera Globetrotter show featured just six of the more famous players at the time, as well as a fictional manager named Granny and a dog mascot named Dribbles. Neither of the latter two appear in this or the other two Scooby episodes, featuring the Globetrotters, though Dribbles does show up in every episode's opening title sequence. Though based on real-life people, none of the actual Harlem Globetrotters voice themselves, though at least the same actors from the first animated series are carried over to their appearances here, including the legendary Scatman Crothers, who would eventually voice a different Globetrotter in the subsequent series produced by Hanna-Barbera. At the time of this video, the only surviving Globetrotter featured in these Scoopy episodes is Geese Ospie. The villains in this episode are the Ghost of Redbeard and his crew. And we're talking the exact same ones featured in Go Away Ghost Ship from the first season of Scooby-Doo Where Are You? 
In fact, not only were the Scooby producers so lazy that they recycled the character models for Redbeard, not to mention his two henchmen for the second time, their first recycle was in the Sandy Duncan episode, they couldn't even be bothered to paint the characters and just made them all white. The laziness shown here really makes this feel like Hanna-Barbera was more focused on advertising one of their other series than producing an actual episode of Scooby-Doo. The ghost pirate scheme was to illegally tap into offshore oil wells to presumably sell the product on the black market. While profitable, had the thieves waited just a few more years, the income they could have received would have been substantial due to the 1970s energy crisis when oil prices skyrocketed. I'm Lieutenant Pete Duggan of the Harbor Patrol. I've never heard the name Duggan pronounced as Duggan before, but apparently that's a thing. I, for one, am never too scared to learn anything new. In fact, those times are often a moment to treasure. And Redbeard wasn't a ghost either? No, he's a crooked oil man who used the Redbeard legend to keep people away while he tapped those offshore oil wells. Redbeard was described by the undercover police lieutenant as a crooked oil man. So were the wells simply ones he had built and never reported? perhaps in an effort to avoid paying taxes? This would make the most sense because rigs like the ones seen in the episode are seldom unmanned. Any legitimate employees would be making some phone calls the minute they saw a 300-year-old galleon approaching their platform. However, the construction of the wells would have taken much more manpower than what we see of Redbeard's crew, meaning the ghost pirate would have had a much larger group of employees or henchmen he'd have to keep quiet. If you're a construction worker seeking a job at another drill site and the foreman can't verify the last employer on your resume because the rig you helped build wasn't officially listed anywhere, surely you'd be asking some questions yourself. Don't call me Shirley. Otherwise, we must assume Redbeard was able to sneak onto the wells, tap into the lines, fill his disguised tanker, and head back to shore to process the materials all without being seen. Or if seen, without being reported. Then again, it's a possibility that the oil wells were owned by a legitimate company and Redbeard had bribed one or two employees there to let him tap into the line. Both scenarios are risky from the standpoint of getting caught as well as initial startup fees. Despite the former being safer because Redbeard controlled all aspects of the crime, I'm leaning toward the latter in terms of profitability and real-world mechanics. Thus, the oil thieves get a design score of 3.5 out of 5. I know by this point it's a foregone conclusion that Hanna-Barbera is going to cheap out on their production, but as already mentioned, this is the second time they used the character model for Redbeard and the third time they used the same models for his two henchmen. Better writing could have made this work. It would have been neat to bring back C.L. Magnus from the original episode. Obviously, if the gang acknowledged their earlier run-in with the ghost of Redbeard, they would have immediately suspected Magnus. The former shipping magnate could have either escaped from prison or been paroled. He didn't even have to be the actual villain, but instead could have put his criminal past behind him and was being framed by a former associate. They could have even tied the Globetrotters in with the episode by making Magnus the owner of the team the Globetrotters were going to face in Miami. Of course, almost every separate Scooby series, film, and direct-to-video production exists in its own universe, which allows the gang to remain teenagers despite them all technically being old enough to collect Social Security and Scooby himself are being replaced at least five times over the years due to the average life expectancy of a Great Dane. And now I'm sad. At best, we get references in later film and television series to the earlier Scooby adventures, but alas, the idea of villains crossing over from one series to another just isn't meant to be in the scooby doo universe. But they glowed like ghosts. Another trick, glow paint. You can buy it at any joke store. The writers did at least try to write off the cheapness of not using color for the ghost pirates by claiming they were covered in glowing paint, but at no point in the episode did the pirates actually glow. Captain Cutler glowed. Redbeard is just painted white. Round them up and put them all in the brig. Aye, aye, Redbeard. Here, have a seat. <laughs> what hit me? <laughs> when 
Redbeard and his crew first appeared, not only were the gang and the Globetrotters not frightened, but they also pretty much just beat the shit out of the ghost crew. This episode could have ended right there. No points to Redbeard or his crew for the scariness of their get-ups. I'm giving the Ghost Pirates an outfit score of 1 out of 5. Even if they earned an extra half point for the alleged glowing, the sheer insult to the Scooby fandom for the blatant cost-cutting used by Hanna-Barbera in this episode erases any positives, no matter how small. The design of the plan was above average, while the outfits were dismal, so how was Redbeard's follow-through? On the one hand, the scheme had proceeded far enough along that the authorities knew something was up. Redbeard had to have been making at least some progress on his plan. On the other hand, the police were already closing in on the oil smugglers, and it was only a matter of time before they were caught, regardless of the gang or the Globetrotters' involvement. As discussed earlier, there were two possibilities for the core of Redbeard's plan. Either he built the wells himself, or was stealing from legitimate companies' rigs. If the former, he could have done a better job hiding the oil equipment. There are structures in the middle of Los Angeles that hide oil drills, some in residential areas with residents who have no idea what they're living next to. I don't know how Redbeard could have disguised the towers to blend in naturally with the seashore. I suppose one of them could have been hidden with a lighthouse facade, but that still would have left the others to be clearly seen as oil rigs. If Redbeard had been tapping into another company's wells, which, as mentioned, I feel the more likely scenario, this would have presented its own danger, not only of being seen, but also from an accounting standpoint, when whoever was responsible for logging the amount of crude being produced would notice the numbers sharply dipping. But then, just like how a bribe would prevent employees from reporting a suspicious galleon parked next to one of the rigs, Greasing the palms of the legitimate oil company's bookkeeper would also allow this plan to succeed. Regardless of either of these two scenarios, it was extremely stupid of Redbeard to have built his tanker truck filling station within sight of the wells. Anyone who ever played Age of Empires knows it's a lot more convenient having your storehouse built as close to the resource as possible, but in real life, having your drop-off point for your stolen goods that close to the scene of the crime just makes it that much easier for the authorities to catch you. When it comes to chasing snoopers away, the ghost pirates also failed miserably until Redbeard whipped this out. <laughs> Yikes! Wall to wall ghosts! Quit now! I'll have them take care of you this instant! We quit! We quit! Just call off your creepy pals! The gang and the Globetrotters were just outsmarted by what's essentially just a light projector you'd find at any 1970s disco. I mean, they still make those. I bought one for my kids when they were still toddlers. This is less of a brilliant prop used by Redbeard, and more the gang of the Globetrotters being really stupid. While the ghost crew did chase everybody with menace, they were easily dispatched by basketballs and having things dropped on top of them. Thus, it's difficult to claim they tried to actually physically harm anyone, so no bonus points for attempted murder. It's also embarrassing for the villain to get scared by the gang in disguise, which we've seen before, but that's usually toward the end of the episode after Fred or Velma figure out the bad guy's scheme. The ghost of Redbeard also ends up trapping his own men at one point, further dropping his rating. I'm giving the ghost of Redbeard a 2 out of 5 for his operation. Though providing an adequate chase for the gang and the Globetrotters, he made a lot of mistakes and lacked the bloodthirst of a committed villain. This leaves the Ghost of Redbeard and his crew with a do score of 2.2 out of 5. I wasn't sure where to bring this up in my analysis, but sharp viewers will note that at no point do I mention the villain's real name, nor do we see his unmasking. That's because we see neither in this episode. The last time we see the Ghost of Redbeard, he's locked up in his ship's hold like the T-Rex at the end of the second Jurassic Park film. Even the unnamed sheep smuggler got to show his face at least once without the werewolf mask. <laughs> what is it, Scoob? I am Groot! <laughs> Did... 
Did they leave Scooby behind? Again? Hey, look! It's an old inn! Who cares if it's old? Let's go in the inn! Considering this was the early 1970s, and the setting is clearly somewhere in rural Florida, the stranded Globetrotters probably had more to worry about than ghost pirates and alligators. None of them appear to be holding a copy of the Green Book. Naturally, Curly. That's cause there's nothing out there. See? Where did he go? Well, if everyone's through seeing things, let's go see about that inn. Infuriating! Fred learned nothing in the previous episode, did he? And hurry before the fog takes all the curl out of my hair. God damn it, Daphne. How about that? Two volunteers. <laughs> Come on, Mark. Don't, don't just sit here. Let's do what the ghost said and leave. Take it easy, Shaggy. We were probably just hearing something. Velma learned nothing either. Go away. Now. Hey, man. Are you trying to scare us? Yes. And for your own good. We learn later this spooky old man was a police detective who legitimately wanted the gang of the Globetrotters to leave for their own safety. So why didn't he just use his radio to send for a couple of tow trucks to pull the vehicles out of the swamp? It's easy to say leave, but where were the stranded travelers supposed to go? At least we can't see those ghost pirates. There aren't any ghosts. See? Hey, they're gone. Why would a boarded-up, abandoned inn in the middle of a swamp still have working electricity? <laughs> it's embarrassing to admit, but I never realized until now that Scooby has human teeth instead of dog teeth. How does walking the plank sound? Corny. I mean, it just isn't done in this day and age. You forget, my day was 300 years ago. This episode aired in 1972. 300 years ago would have been 1672. The golden age of piracy was roughly between the 1650s and the 1730s, so the Scooby writers got a historical fact right. Good for them! It's a police helicopter I've had circling until I could find Redbeard's hideout. Something tells me you're not really a swamp rat, Swampy Pete. You know, I'm no expert in search and recovery, but if I were looking for the hideout of an illegal oil drilling operation, those very tall oil towers easily seen from land would be a good place to start looking. <laughs> so who are the Globetrotters playing? The Miami Marauders or the Skyscrapers? And that's my ranking of the villains from the sixth set of episodes of the new Scooby-Doo movies, shown here along with the ones from my previous video. We finally get to see a villain with a decent do score, but time will tell if anyone else from this series ends up with as high a rating. I hope to see you next time. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. It was a massive ear infection. It swelled the entire left side of my head and displaced my jaw enough that I could barely eat or speak. In fact, I'm still mostly deaf on this side. Keep those earbuds clean, kids.